the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Roots of Reconstruction by Rusas John Rushduni Narrated by Shelby Luke Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Russus John Rushduni. In lieu of the judgment of God across this nation, I appeal to you to listen, learn, and live as the Holy Spirit guides you in the truth of the Word of God. The words and prompting of fallible men do not hold a candle to the truth of Scripture, and the truth of Scripture will only be words to our ears unless we exhort, establish, and exercise these infallible words in every area of thought and life. Calcedon Report number 114, February 1975. The modern state, having divorced itself from biblical faith, has not only lost the criterion for truth, but it has also lost the ability to create a working society. Work in the Bible is God's ordained means whereby man gains dominion. Work for modern man is an ugly necessity which takes away time from the pursuit of pleasure. In turning from work to pleasure, modern man has chosen the pleasure principle over the reality principle as the operating standard for life. The inability of most cultures to advance beyond a limited degree is due to their distaste for work. Work is regarded in most of history, as well as in much of the modern world, as a degrading and distasteful necessity to be required by force of the lower classes. A college girl, a relative, shared an apartment with three other girls, one of them from Latin America. Although the Latin American girl came from a family of somewhat less means than the other three, who were of the American middle class, in terms of her country she belonged to the upper class. She never picked up a dish, In the bathroom or bedroom, she dropped her clothing to the floor in the expectation that someone should pick them up for her. She obviously expected a full-time servant to feed her, pick up after her, and be at her beck and call. Work was something which should not be expected of her. Her dignity placed her beyond work. This attitude with respect to work is an increasing evidence. In the Soviet Union, the first generation had the background of disciplined work because of their upbringing in old Russia. With the third generation, this discipline is waning, and work is regarded with contempt and production suffers. All over the world, a growing element, products of the humanistic state, and its culture regard work as an evil. Significant sectors of the new left believe that machines and automation can eliminate work and, quote, free, unquote, man. And only the evil conspiracies of the capitalists prevent this. This is their goal, to be, quote, free, unquote, from work. But first of all, freedom from work is a surrender of dominion. Work was and is the God-ordained means to dominion. In spite of all its political stupidities, The United States remains the world leader because of its still remarkable productive abilities, a continuing consequence of the Puritan work ethic. Man cannot escape work. He will either work as a man gaining and exercising dominion, or he will work as a whipped slave, but he will work. Second, a godly work ethic is time conscious and respects time. Much contempt is expressed today for people who are clock conscious, as though freedom means despising time. But time is life. It is man's most precious commodity. Time lost cannot be recovered, nor can time be boarded up. To despise time and clocks is to be suicidal. A godly work ethic practices the most basic conservation of all, the conservation of time and life. Third, work is the theological fact. It is God-ordained for the creature who alone is created in God's image, man. It is God's appointed way for man to realize the implications of that image, namely, righteousness, holiness, 
knowledge, and dominion. By means of work, man is able to fulfill God's creation mandate and calling, and to become a ruler over himself, his calling, his household, and the world around him. Basic to the dream of the humanistic state is the creation of a new world order, one in which man supposedly, quote, finds, unquote, himself without God's help. The realization of man in history is seen as the rebirth of man, as the new God and the death of the God of Scripture. This is to be the freedom of man. This status dream is not only antinomian, an example hostile to God's law, but also anti-work. Man's liberation is seen as freedom from God, law, and work. But life cannot be redefined. The conditions of life are given by God. Life is God's creation, and its conditions are also totally God-created. No more than man can live without breathing and eating can he live without law and work, nor can he live without God, without thereby choosing death. As wisdom declared ages ago, quote, All they that hate me love death, unquote. Proverbs 8.36 The conditions of life require the fountain of life. The modern state, however, has by its humanism cut itself off from the fountain of life. It no longer has the ability to provide meaning to life, nor can it give work any enduring meaning. Social cohesiveness is waning, and the city becomes less and less a community and more and more a battleground between classes, races, and gangs. Modern man is rootless and cynical. He has trouble living with himself, and to live and work with others is for him a great burden. A few generations ago, one of the most popular and common proverbs of the Western world held that, quote, Every man is the son of his own works, unquote. An example, a man could not blame others for his own failures. Increasingly, however, this belief has given way to the approach or classical Greek tragedy, namely, that man is a prisoner of his past. Classical and modern humanism are agreed on this radical environmentalist position. Work is futile, for the past has doomed us. Humanism then, and now, ends up hostile to life and to man. The future, like the past, will be dominated by those creatures which can work with purpose, ability, and zeal. Oratory can command votes, but purposive work commands history. Calcedon Report number 115, March 1975 Institutions, as they lose their function and purpose, forfeit also their lives, or at least their necessary role in society. For example, the modern image of a knight or a lord is of a hand-kissing fashion plate and snob. For medieval man, he was a necessary source of law and order and a capable protector. However unjust and arbitrary he might be at times, he was still so valuable that his uses outweighed his faults. Medieval man knew that his lord had a poor life expectancy because of his military and protective function. As late as 1330 to 1479, about one in two of every English duke's sons died a violent death, and as a class, their life expectancy was only 24 years. Only later, when knights and lords lost their necessary function to medieval man and began to work for their self-perpetuation, and advancement in relation to the monarch, did they become irrelevant to those who once found them necessary to society. The peers of the realm became intolerable to European man, not because they had become worse in character, because it can be argued that their character commonly improved, but because they became irrelevant and therefore a burden. The same point can be made with reference to monarchy, and also the church. For most of European history, the church was the most necessary institution, and even in some eras of very real corruption, the church was not only tolerated, but its reform urgently sought on all sides. As the institution most basic to the structuring and development of society, life without the church was to most men unthinkable. Thus, even as they damned the evils in the church, 
they sought with intensity its reform and renewal. However, where the church made itself irrelevant, men gradually bypassed it and, from a necessary institution, the church became an optional one. Once as necessary as daily bread, it became a luxury or an extra item for those with a taste for it. Then and now, the church has done this to itself. In the medieval era, the concern of the church for self-perpetuation, the development of naturalistic theologies and philosophies, and the growth of mysticism and pietism made the church progressively an irrelevant luxury. The Reformation and Counter-Reformation for a time restored relevancy, but the same old tendencies soon rendered the church irrelevant and optional rather than a necessary institution. In the modern era, the state and the state school have been the necessary institutions, and man's hopes have been closely tied to the state and the state school. The same irrelevance, however, is again setting in. The state school in Europe is mainly geared to preparation for civil service in the United States to the democratic life. In either case, it is less and less relevant to man's basic problems and needs. As a result, in the United States especially, statist education is dying, and independent Christian schools are growing very rapidly. Indicative of the irrelevance of the state is the fact that, in the United States, as much money is spent for private policing and protective devices as for statist policing. The state has so hampered its police that one of the most basic functions of the state, protection from criminals, is passing into private hands. Similarly, courts are increasingly geared to adjudicating equality rather than justice. And as a result, the very central function of justice is less and less expected from the state. As a result, both the right and the left are agreed that the state as it exists, the establishment, is the enemy. Both seek to capture the state and reform it, but increasingly, most people expect less and less good from the state in any hands and more and more evil and corruption. The modern humanistic state, once religiously revered, is increasingly distrusted and feared. While the final break is not yet here and the modern state is not yet regarded as irrelevant, there is a tendency in that direction. Associations, contracts, business arrangements, and prices are set with an eye to avoiding status controls and intervention. Instead of utilizing the state, a growing segment of the population work to avoid the state a most telling indicator of approaching irrelevance. Add to this the fact that in the United States and elsewhere, recent elections saw a remarkably low percentage of people voting and a trend towards irrelevance becomes clear. The state was once universally regarded as a necessary good. Now it is seen by its very defenders as simply a necessary evil. The modern humanistic idea of the state is thus in transition to irrelevance. This means, of course, very dangerous and trying years ahead. It means major dislocations and upheavals in what is already the most bloody and revolutionary of centuries. But it also means a time of opportunity without equal to present the whole counsel of God and His law as the only tenable basis for men and nations. There is no other alternative to tyranny and anarchy. Humanistic man's order is coming to its necessary conclusion. Unless the Lord's people set forth His answers, the enemy will provide His alternative. Galcedon Report number 116, April 1975 As we have seen, institutions can lose their necessary place in society as they decline from their function and purpose. Knights and kings, once necessary to man, became irrelevant and were cast aside as impediments to society and the church, once the key institution became a peripheral one, membership in which was optional and whose social role was increasingly minor. One such key era of transition when institutions began to fail men and men began to turn against them was the 1400s. Long before the Reformation, men were feeling the shock of a world out of joint. The basic twin ideas of a state and calling governed men's minds 
and under different terms they still do. It was assumed that men are sinners, but it was still held that in a working society, men acted in some degree in conformity with their position and calling. An old man did not try to act like a youngster. A rich man made a point of being charitable, and a judge remembered that justice had to be his primary concern. Whatever their failings, men had to fulfill the requirements of their office or estate and calling. Men did not suddenly become worse in the 1400s any more than they have in the 1900s. Evil tendencies were always there. What happened, rather, was the decline of strength of purpose and calling among the godly, so that society passed into ungodly hands by default. Thus, as men of the day looked at church, state, and law, they felt that the sense of a state and calling were gone, and that without them, their clergy and rulers had turned into enemies. The Reformatio Sigismundi, C. 1438, declared, quote, Obedience is dead. Justice is grievously abused. Nothing stands in its proper order. Therefore God has withdrawn His grace from us. We ignore His commandments. Unquote. Joan Geiler, in 1498, preached on the consequences of the loss of a state and calling. Quote, Power-mad fools, unquote, now ruled everywhere. Indignant clergymen cried out that the church itself led in the violations of God's laws, and in 1498, in Raynard the Fox, it was charged, quote, Little crooks are hanged, big crooks govern our lands and cities, unquote. A common complaint was that the law had become an instrument of injustice. One pamphleteer of C. 1500 wrote, quote, Adultery is licit, blasphemers are respected, the usurer has the law on his side, murderers sit in the judgment seat, and the plunderer of the church has become the very shepherd of the house of worship, unquote. As early as 1493, desperate German peasants began to plan revolt under the banner, quote, God's justice alone, unquote, a movement which led soon to disaster. More than a few had come to agree with the proverb of the day, quote, the devil is master of the world, unquote. In spite of all this, it could well be argued that men were economically and materially better off than they had been a century or more earlier. The marks of progress were alive in one area after another. It was in 1492 that Columbus discovered America, and this was not an isolated event, but part of a pattern of aggressive and inquiring advance scientifically, geographically, and commercially. More people had full stomachs to complain on than people in earlier eras had. It can be argued that it was the very rapidity of change in progress which left people restless and unhappy. The tempo of history had become too rapid, and the movement of things too complex for many who yearned for the imagined simplicity and peace of the past. All this is clearly true and more, but it ignores a central fact. The marks of progress were there, but not of justice, nor of faith. Western man in 1500 found his society meaningless in terms of the requirements of faith and justice. To the movers of society in increasing numbers, talk of God and justice had become irrelevant. It was a later age which affected dismay at Machiavelli, 1469 to 1527, and his writings, not his own era. Machiavelli had simply expressed the philosophy of his century. Man should be governed by and should govern in terms of what is, not what ought to be, in terms of pragmatism, not religion. It was not until the 20th century that man again affirmed openly the same philosophy, and the results are again the same, the loss of a state and calling, the loss of meaning. Even though the man on the street is, by and large, a pragmatist himself, he hates, fears, and distrusts politicians as pragmatists, and he has contempt for a pragmatic clergy. The writers of our times are again full of self-pity for their plight, and while themselves unjust cry out for 
justice. Man cannot live long without justice. A world without justice soon quenches the spirit of man or moves him to savage rebellion. But without the foundation of faith in the triune God, man's ideas of justice turn out only to be injustice. Isaiah declared, 5914F, quote, And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil make himself a prey. Unquote. Because of the primacy of truth, absolute transcendental truth had departed from society, justice, and integrity were gone, and men were governed by and governed in terms of their evil. Rome had world power in its hands when, in the person of Pilate, it pronounced truth irrelevant. Quote, what is truth? Unquote. John 18.38, said Pilate, finding truth irrelevant even as he faced it in Jesus Christ. Without truth, Rome decayed and finally collapsed. It was not really overthrown. It fell apart. Today, without truth, the modern world, with its pragmatism, is decaying from within. There can be no regeneration and reconstruction apart from Him who is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14.6 Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Bruce's John Rushman. Lord willing, we will be reading again next week. Until then, may God bless your endeavors as you serve the one and only King Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the love he had shown us by his paying the very price. It was there at Calvary's tree, where he died for you.
The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.